It seems like everything in my life has been a bit circuitous, off the charts, normal, you know, pathway. Um, I was, my family had a restaurant and I was kind of engaged in that but always knew I wanted to design since I was 13. And so I got kind of sucked into the vortex of the family. And so at 30 I went back to school at the Art Institute. And I finished in three years and fast forward I went to New York and interned with Jeffrey Bean because I'm a bit of a snob and I. I'd rather work for free for someone I really respect, a master, than get paid what you're going to get paid anyway in New York. And so I waitressed at night and had the most amazing experience for about a year and a half. And then I came back to Chicago and started Marie Pitchin. Um, so when you started, you had talked to me about professioning craze coming So I associated, um, my, so I launched with accessories. When I came back from New York, I knew I wanted to do something and I wanted to do it quick and I wanted to do something that would be um, manageable as a one-man team. And um, unbeknownst to me, there was this tipping point, as Malcolm Gladwell would put it, of the Pashmina craze. And I know all of you in this room probably had never heard of that, right? Because I've asked my, in, my team and they're like, and uh, Pashminas, what is that? So in 1991, there was this kind of burst of, of this idea of ca these cashmere scarves and the American woman started to embrace the idea of wearing scarves and wraps, which is probably more common in Europe, let's say. And so I, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know this was happening, but I just knew, okay, I could do accessories myself in a very simple way, but in a very opulent way, uh, appropriate for what I thought was the marketplace. So that was the beginning of everything. <laughs> um, so when you started making these accessories, how, you know, a lot of people in the audience, they have a product that they're making, um, but they, they don't really know how to get it out, out there. They have this beautiful thing sitting there like you did. How did you then take these um, accessories and, you know, get a name from it? Um, yeah, I think that's the hardest piece for all of us, right? When you have something to sell or to show. Um, I showed everything, everyone I possibly could get to give me a minute. Um, I called my first store, of course, again, I already told you I'm a snob. So I called the best store in Chicago, which at the time was called Ultimo. And the owner uh, was an amazing woman named Joan Weinstein and some, made me seem like not a snob at all. She was very, very particular about everything. So, you know, you, when you make this call, you're kind of like scared out of your mind and you know you have to do it because otherwise you're never going to get to the next place. So she was gracious enough and she bought my collection and that opened up every door because she had such a a reputation and respect and um, I was very fortunate that you bought my first collection. And then, um, so you, so they bought your first collection and then uh, how did you go from accessories to uh, doing garments? Um, um, I'm going to back up for one second. The one thing I want to say is like you can't be shy and you can't be afraid. I was terrified. Every time you make a phone call to a store and they kind of go, ah, we're, you know, send us a picture. Or send it. And it was before, you know, where you could email lookbooks, right? So we had to do everything printed and send it out. And, um, you know, the rejection that comes with that, I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, so, you know, when I talk about this one call, there were probably other calls around it that were all, um, no, sorry, thank you. Um, and so I was doing the accessories, and after Ultimo picked it up in Chicago, um, I was fortunate that Barney's, Bergdorf and Sachs bought the collection. And again, this is like crazy insane. In the moment, I had no idea how lucky I was or how, I don't, it's surreal. Um, 
I was moving along. Accessories to me are kind of one-dimensional, and I'm, my background and why I went to the Art Institute is really a lot about sculpture. So for me, I really had to design clothes because that's where you get more three-dimensional. So the good news is the stores liked what I was doing with the accessories, so they asked if I was, well, why wasn't I doing more clothing? So of course that gave me the, the nudge to start introducing some garments. And it just kind of, everything was a, just a sort of a progression. Um, to be honest, it sort of swept me along. You know, I was sort of just, it, it, none of it was as deliberate as I, or as strategic or as, you know, I'm working on a project with um, some MBAs, right? And they look at everything from a very different world place than we do. This was so organic, so instinctual, and I highly encourage you to own that piece of, of the gift that we have as creatives is our instinct and trust your gut, but be a sponge, be as aware as you can be of everything around you. So I think that informed what I was doing. Um, I wouldn't say I was, you know, I would say it was timing and, and a lot of was really somewhat subconscious. Does that make sense? Yeah. Trust the universe. <laughs> I don't wear Birkenstocks, but I do trust the universe. <laughs> One season. One season, yeah. right? So yeah. it's kind of unusual that yeah. you did that. And it's so unusual. And that's what catapulted you yeah. to the start. Um, so would you say that the environment of the fashion industry today would allow for somebody to step in and replicate what you did, like the climate of the industry? Or? I mean, I think that certainly the, it does happen here and there. And I think it's, but I think it's harder because there's so many more of us doing this. I mean, since Project Run Runway, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, a, it's been an explosion of aspiring fashion designers. So I think that's complicated the process for all of you trying to jump in. Um, I think, I, I won't say it was easy where I was, but I do think it's more complicated now because there's so many more trying to get even the same job or, you know, showing a collection. So, um, did that answer the question? Yeah. Um, if you had mentioned to you that, you know, the 1990s to 2010 was a much easier time to jump in, and, and since then, um, e-commerce has changed things. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in, in some respects, e-commerce has made it more accessible, because look at anyone could set up an e-commerce site, right, and show your collection. But on the other hand, I think that's caused some challenges in terms of the, re the more traditional path for retailers, right? because there are so much more, they're being more discriminating because their, their challenge is how do they show, have things that no one else has. So I think those things all contrib contribute to it being far more complex of a puzzle than what I encountered in that time space, in that space. Also the economy, I mean, you know, it was thriving, the 90s. I mean, m my wraps and scarves were $2,000. I mean, for Joan, I couldn't make them big enough. This is Ultimo store. And then Bergdorf had the same thing. I mean, we were selling things that were crazy, all hand embroidered. I mean, I have no interest. It's a whole different story of why I don't do that right now. But it's not also, the audience isn't there. And we don't dress that way. It was just a crazy times all the way through like 2006, seven. Oh my God, such a difference. Um, when I, my family had a restaurant, as I mentioned, it was a, like a five-star Chicago, amazing restaurant. Women, men and women dressed amazing. It was a five-star restaurant, right? You go to a five-star now and people are in sneakers and t-shirts. It's kind of annoying, personally. <laughs> I mean, there's a beauty to dressing. Like, I love this theme of ugly, but there's a beauty to like, okay, you're going to a really nice restaurant, you're gonna spend a lot of money, why not kind of feel good about what you're wearing? I mean, I don't think it's something so oppressive. I'm not saying a man should wear a tie, but just step it up, right? And it's really tragic, because you see women dressed really kind of chic and cute, right? And the guys, what's with you guys? <laughs> I mean, kind of dumpy down, like, don't show up at my door like that. <laughs> he has great style. But you know, I think there's time and place. I think I like the idea of that part of my, I did an exhibit at the Field Museum and there were three themes and the most important theme to me was the idea of armor. Uh, oh, what we wear is armor. Like you all thought about, okay, you're coming here today, you're doing something tonight. You choose what you wear for a reason and I don't think we utilize that tool in the way as, as, as with as much impact as you could possibly gather from it. It's very useful and that's what I try to, 
instill in what I design, like the impact. And it could be very quiet. It's not like you have to walk in the room and have some crazy thing on, which is fun too, but there's impact to what we wear and the message we give, right? I mean, I know we all want to be a little bit, I don't know about you, but I, I would assume most people in this room are, I'm kind of a rebel. I mean, I kind of like to, if someone tells me no, I'm right there doing it. So, but in the, in the clothes piece, I think it's kind of, that's a dumb place to play rebel. You know, like I sometimes am invited to do talks for like, um, like companies like, um, uh, what was it, Deloitte, uh, and they're new hires, right? And I say, look at you have to embrace the culture you signed up for. Now, if you're in a tech space, then yeah, you could go, I work, the, our studio is across the street from Groupon, and it blows my mind where people were to work. Flip-flops, jeans, t-shirts, like kind of, I like t-shirts, but okay, step it up, boys. Um, the quality of the fabric, you know, that it's not look like you slept in it, whatever. <laughs> anyway, oh man, I digress. <laughs> Call me in. <laughs> And that's not why I was invited to talk today. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so I kind of want to talk about the celebrity aspect of what you do. So you've dressed some of the most famous people. You know, I mean, this is Obama. He's been a client of yours for 10 years. Um, Oprah Winfrey, Book Shields. Uh, I actually, I don't, you guys don't know this, but I actually used to work in the same building as Maria on the same floor. She had a studio I worked for a design firm. And we all shared a common bathroom. And so I would go to the bathroom, and there'd be Secret Service standing in the bathroom. <laughs> I use it, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was just hilarious. They were there all the time. It was during the inauguration when he was running for president. So um, what is that like, having Secret Service at your door and, and talking to celebrities and being in that scene? Um, you know, I've been, first of all, the part of celebrity that I'm fortunate about is the celebrities that I've worked with have never been divas. Because we all hear the diva story, and that would just be a total turn off to me. So I've been really fortunate. The people that I've encountered have all been really authentic and great. And yeah, when the Secret Service shows up, it brings the whole experience to another place. You're like, oh, you know, um, I don't know. The whole, th like I said, my life has been surreal. <laughs> I hope all of yours are too. It's great. <laughs> it's great. It's better than glamour. It's surreal. <laughs> Um, 90 percent of what they wore from my, uh, most celebrities is what has been in my collection. Occasionally there have been ha, had, were situations where, okay, um, Oprah was, um, um, she was going to the premiere of Denzel Washington's movie and um, there, I had a fantasy and, and she was able to let me have this happen. I created the skirt and it was normally out of just a fabric, but my dream idea for the skirt was that it would be leather and it goes to the floor and it was very opulent and it was leather that was like paperweight and had all these pleats. Well, I needed somebody that could afford that, right? So then I don't mind doing custom because then I can create something that really becomes like art. And you know, so that occasionally a celebrity gives you that opportunity. But by and large, you know what? I don't like doing custom. I don't, I mean, it interferes and I think it interferes in your creative process because then you're getting all, especially in fashion, you know, it's like you're getting all these blips like, okay, I want the bow here and the whatever. It's like, no, that's just not the way I think. So most of the time it's been straight away, yeah. including Mick Jagger. I wanted to tell you this, I forgot. So Mick Jagger, he, didn't, he got it from Ultimo actually, but he was here touring and he bought one of my crazy scarves and wore it for the concert that oh, night. Awesome. When he was at, um, yeah, I forgot to tell you that. Yeah. Again, that's that's where you know that's our gift, and you know I don't you can't mess with someone's creative vision. It gets you, and you know I think it's important to listen, especially if you're trying to do like distribution on the wholesale level, right? You, buyers are going to come in, and even and if you contract a sales agent, they're going to come in with their ideas, right? And you kind of sign up for that on some levels, but then it, I mean at the end of the day, you've got to dissect through all that and decide what do you want to listen to, because all of a sudden otherwise you're doing something that isn't 
what you set out for and you've got to sort of stand your ground as you know this is really where I want to be so it's a fine line but that's really where it's but it's on a high level It'd be like the president of Bergdorf Goodman when they give you advice you kind of listen as opposed to one woman saying I think the neckline is too low Whatever. Right. <laughs> so um, when you are designing what is your creative process like um, like where do you pull inspiration from um, I always keep inspiration boards going constant. Just anything I see, I just keep putting up. I have books that I collect uh, and just paste in and say, I mean, I always feel like just having this sort of library, this reserve, it's sort of sitting out there and I don't necessarily even have to go to those things once I've saved it. It's sort of like in my subconscious. Um, so I always have this sort of stuff moving around me that I don't know how it's gonna filter in. But I'm particularly um, interested in, like, especially with this new collection, architecture, um, and a, a very minimal sort of, um, anything that has this minimal sense. So I, I was just telling my assistant, um, someone sent me these photos um, from a pilot's, uh, they're called, uh, some pilot in a plane shot these images. And I've seen over the, you know, there's a book called Over the Planet or something, those kind of shots, but there, it's this one shot, it's um, in Holland and it's over the tulip fields. Oh my God, the colors, it's just like these beautiful stripes. You, you don't know it's fields of flowers. It just becomes this beautiful composition like a painting. Mm -hmm. So it's stuff like that. I think they have um, uh, one of your collections in here. Yeah, the spring 2008. You wanted to just show the inspiration that... Which it's uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Richard Serra. And you say, well, how does that relate to fashion, right? I mean, but what I love about his work is the sense of, you know, how do you build something that sits in that space, that scale and that weight. So how I interpreted that, um, if you go to the next slide, is this idea of like suspension and these ellipses and, you know, because these garments look pretty simple, but they're the first ones to end up on the sale rack if they're not constructed right, because they don't say, sit on the body well. So the source of inspiration was the, his, his, his aesthetic, but also the idea of, you know, how do you make it actually work three-dimensionally on a woman's body? I think there's one more question. This was fun, Marie Antoinette. Um, it was particularly inspired by Sofia Coppola's film. And it's just the kind of the wildness of the whole period, the, the colors, the profusion of materials that were used. And we kind of distilled it down to kind of a clean, but definite re reference to it. I mean, the thing for me with inspiration is I don't want it to look like, oh, she went to Santa Fe and everything's turquoise, right? So it's always very, <laughs> it's always very sub, it's very, very sub, you'd have to ask me what the inspiration is and that I'd prefer it that way. I think that's what it should be, right? It should be something that we just sort of absorb and then sh let it seep its way into what we're doing. I do both. Um, I, um, I really feel, and, I, I, and to, so to add a third dimension to it, which I don't do at all, is I don't get designing on a computer. Sorry. I just feel so removed from everything about my like, body, because I think that's what, like, I love when I put a pen or I see anyone put a pen or a pencil to a piece of paper and see what kind of comes out. There's this connection in a different way that I feel is cut off. Um, but draping is even more interesting because you get out of your head more because now it's this, like this sculptural idea that you can't, that you can't imagine. And what, so I, I think some of my greatest work has been just being in front of a mannequin draping. And so usually I'll get a couple ideas that'll bounce the whole rest of the collection which could be sketched. But that already gives me the foundation of the theme of where it's going to go. Um, you know, I, I have to, I, I, um, the, the good news when I, I, so I closed my company in 2010, Maria Pinto, and what I had the opportunity to do over the following two years was um, a lot of interesting projects, and one of them was, uh, the first thing I did was sign up for Oxpo. Um, it's an arts program through the Art Institute up in Saugatuck, um, because I hadn't painted in 20 years that I had my company. 
So I started painting again, and that's become an absolute constant. It informs everything I do right now. Um, I have one day a week that's a studio day, and I, I'm excited to say that I just took, for the first time, I feel so grown up. I have a studio at Mana Contemporary. Do you all know about this? It's really cool. You should check it out. They have an open studio. Um, I think it's uh, Sunday the 8th where artist studios are all open. It's on Cermak. It's a beautiful space. So I just took over a little, little space in there. I'll be there if you want to stop by. Is that for your painting? That's for all my painting and creative work, yeah. That's really cool. Um, and then you also do collaborations with dance companies? Mm -hmm. I've had the good fortune of doing costumes for the Joffrey Ballet, um, another company here in Chicago called The Seldoms. Um, and that's kind of, I really love that opportunity because um, it sort of takes me out of myself. I'm not the orchestrator of the project, I'm just a piece. So it's really kind of nice um, to separate and you know, get inside of someone else's vision. Um, so this was for um, the Joffrey Ballet. It's um, Edward Leong, he's this brilliant um, choreographer from New York. And um, it was amazing to work with him. There were 20 dancers actually, so when they all came out, it was really spectacular. I don't have a shot of it, but there's a shot where um, there's a skirt that's remo removed and it's to the floor and he, his choreographer is re choreography is amazing and so the way this woman moves with this skirt it, he had, and there's ten of them on the stage at one time it becomes this whole composition that's really extraordinary. So, um, and then this was my first piece actually, it was with the founder of uh, the jo Joffrey, Gerald Arpino, he gave me my first break to try to do this. Um, he was, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he was this amazing, kind of quirky, older guy. And um, I went up to him one night at a cocktail party and I said, oh, Mr. Arpino, I have a fantasy. And I could feel him like, <laughs> roll back, like, she's some crazy woman, get her out of here. Um, <laughs> and I said, it's someday I would love to do costumes for you. So he goes, okay, baby. And if any of you know him, know of him, remember him, that's the kind of how he would speak. He said, okay, baby, I'll get in touch with you sometime. And fast forward, um, I was fortunate to get the commission to do that. And then, I think there's one of the Seldoms. Oh, yes, no. The Seldoms is a really da cool dance company that you should all check out. Yeah, so Car her name is Carrie Hansen. And she came to me and she said, I want you to do costumes. And I said, sure. And we started talking about the framework of the uh, performance. And I said, but I don't want to do, I don't want to start from zero. I want to use reclaimed. So I went to Salvation Armies and I went to Recycle Shops. And nothing you see is what it was. It's all something that was recreated, but from a found um, um, object, so to speak. So it was really, it's a f I, I love that experience of collaborating with, I mean, for the most part, 90% of my life, I like to be leading my own sort of thing. <laughs> I'll be honest. And, um, but I like these projects that allow me to be creative and on someone else's sort of pain and suffering. <laughs> actually craft someone else's vision, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they kind of tell you what they're looking for, it's a costume piece. But they pretty, I mean, uh, they also know me well enough that they kind of have to give me free reign. And I highly recommend that. Make sure you like run your show. In terms of the costumes, like you could have an opinion and I'll ha be happy to look at that. Mm -hmm. But if, you and, if you're you going to give me this task, then you kind of have to trust me, right? And so that's, I think, the relationship you want. You want someone you can collaborate with, but it's about trust. I have to trust them, they have to trust me. So. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you closed, in, you closed your shop in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that time in your life and just how things changed for you? Um, it's never easy. <laughs> um, you know, it was the hardest thing and the best thing and the worst thing I ever did. Wow, is that all like contradictory? Um, you know, we were riding a crest and in 2008 things started really shifting and we rode out to nine and by the end of nine I was like, you know what, this is just not fun anymore. And I was speaking to this gentleman here earlier and I'm like, if it stops being fun, what's the point? So I just like, you know what, taking a break. And it was a huge decision and you know, I always question, was it the right decision? But you made the decision. But what it opened up was this unbelievable opportunity of things that I had no idea would be were in front of me when I closed. A um, couple months into it, I took a month off and then a, I got a phone call from this uh, man who just bought this store called uh, Mark Shale. Uh, actually, the Field Museum was first. I can't remember what the order of any of it is. Sagatuck was first painting. And then I was given this opportunity to be creative director for a store called Mark Shale, um, which is a pretty conservative store. 
and um, I was at first like, really? No way. And then I, the more I talked to him and his vision, I was like, this is really exciting. But again, he gave me complete creative control. I bought everything and anything that I wanted within the certain parameters of the price levels and the, uh, the client, because it was this professional woman. And um, I'm not sure if that's me or, sorry. Um, so, um, so it was an interesting experience, again, to be on, collaborate on something, kind of be in it, but not really be 100% in it, in terms of the risk factor. And, um, and then I did an exhibit at the Field Museum. So all these, it was like this perfect collision of opportunity and experience, and most important was the painting, um, which I think you saw some of it. So um, you, when you were working for our show, you were uh, the buyer and uh, the creative director and all of that. And uh, you were, when you were working there, you were kind of given the task to try and like, craft this New idea of like rebrand the store. I mean, it was a store that was uh, in existence for decades, um, and it, it had had about 13 stores at one point, and it was in and out of bankruptcy twice. And so they tasked me with the rebranding of it, which I thought was absolutely possible. I, I, I think it's, it had a space in Chicago, or, or anywhere for that matter, but it needed to be refreshed because the professional woman doesn't wear a boxy man's suit anymore, right? There's a lot of women that are going to the office from here, I, I would assume. We all dress different now. We don't dress that way. So I thought this is great. It'd be really interesting. So I was tasked with leading a buying team. And so I was able to, I mean, I saw collections from everywhere, but at a very different level than I, what I was designing. I was designing luxury. My dresses started at $1,000. And the requir requirement was that the garments be, the dress would be between 250 and 500. So, um, I'm not sure if that's what it is. Yeah, so you were kind of trying to find like, a, like the more affordable market but still high quality yeah. fashion for them. It just it wouldn't work for this brand necessarily? Or? No, it worked, but I, I mean, I, I think what happened was in terms of why I left. Mm -hmm. I left because I didn't feel like they were getting a footing on the rebranding idea. Because they thought if they brought me in, I could, the, the universe would, ch you know, the world would change, right? You can't just bring one person in. You have to tell the story. You have to do a lot of marketing, a lot of PR to get people to understand that it's something different. Like, I have to say, none of you would have shopped in it before I was there. But after I was there for two seasons, you would have all shopped there. It was the coolest stuff. Right, Chan? Um, <laughs> um, and so I just, you know, after... I, I, I stay very committed to something, but when something isn't moving, the one thing that I highly recommend is, you know, we're all, individually, we're kind of a brand, right? Um, I'm a brand, in a sense, and that's why they partnered with me. And I felt at some point that it was going to damage my brand. And I felt, okay, it's not going where I think it should go, so I had to thank them and move on. But what it did was it brought three or four things to my awareness was, one, I never want to be in the corporate world. Two, I live to design. It's a lifeline. Um, and I saw this window of opportunity that didn't exist, which would have been perfect for Mark Shale, which is why I launched M2057. And so we launched this last year on Kickstarter, actually. You get, yeah, I'm sure you all know what Kickstarter is. Right? So unbeknownst to me, I had no idea what I was really getting into. Um, <laughs> it was a big challenge, but we reached our, we exceeded all goals in the fashion space. So, you know, the higher the risk, the more re potential reward, but it's a fine line if you don't, you know, if you don't win it, right? And you set the goal. So call me crazy. When I laid out the plan for what I wanted to do with them for 2057, I knew we would need about 250000 The challenge with Kickstarter is you have a window of time. We chose 45 days. The most you could do is 60. And you have to determine the amount of money you want to raise. And if you don't raise every penny of it, you get nothing. So the stakes are really high. And we set the stake at 250000 which shoot me now. But at the same time, I think if we didn't do that, OK, we, well, let's say we set it for 100000 OK, we would reach the 100000 and everyone gone home and happy. So, and, and it, wouldn't have warranted, it wouldn't have warranted the press that we received. You know, I've been very, very fortunate. The press has always been very kind to me. But I think you know, it, it wasn't just kind to me. There was a fact here. We broke all records. We kind of earned the awareness of what we did, and it was a painful process, I'll be honest with you. It was 45 days, and it wasn't like right out of the gate. And we had amazing press, but our audience, the women that we were selling to, didn't know what Kickstarter was. So we had to like 
knock on doors, create parties, create events to bring awareness, not just to the brand, but to what Kickstarter was. Like, what do I write a check for? What am I getting out of this? So, you know, but the, we, the stakes were high. When we closed the, 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 the campaign on Sat, we finished, the, we reached our goal on Saturday afternoon. We were in USA Today on Saturday afternoon. Like, they were just, everyone was watching this thing. I was trying not to. And on Monday, we hit $290,000. And so then we got a call from Charlie Rose, and we were on Charlie Rose show on Wednesday. But again, it wasn't because we were slackers, it was because we were like, we were full on. And we, I was fortunate, and you know, this is something I'll share with all of you. There's so many people that love to be surrounded by uh, creative types, right? And uh, lawyers and tech people, because there's something, you know, whether you have it or you don't have it, people like being surrounded by it, especially if you don't have it and want it, right? So there's ways to surround yourself. And I've never been um, scheming about this, but I've been always gifted with great people who came in, come into my space. Like when I decided to do um, Kickstarter, I, I went to a friend of mine and I said, I think I'm doing Kickstarter, and he owned a restaurant. And he had a good client who is Josh Golden, who runs Table XI. And so he said, oh, I don't think you should do that. Emmanuel says, oh, I don't think you should do that. So then I get a phone call that night. He goes, I talked to a friend of mine, and I think you should talk to him. So he tells Josh, this friend of mine is a fashion designer. She's thinking about doing Kickstarter, like as if Josh didn't know who I was, right? And he's laughing. Yeah, tell her to call me. Well, he, he partnered his company to help me do Kickstarter, like on every level. I mean, for three months, they were part of my team. And it wasn't because I could write them a check. It was because they believed in it. And they were going to be part of the, you know, the win. So my advice to you is like, there's tons of people. Don't let the whole idea of like, how do you do it alone? Because you're never going to do it alone. It, again, it's all about collaboration. So just seek out those people that can help you reach your, share the process. I mean, I think that's part of the, the cool piece of what I can do. I mean, I just, it requires so many people. We had photographers, we have filmmaker. A friend of mine moved from Chicago to California, always wanted to shoot with me. We never shot together. And he came to Chicago for three days and did my film, because you have to do a film for Kickstarter. So again, it's like reach out to people in your network. I mean, everyone wants to kind of get be part of your thing and then remember to give back. So now once I've received, now I try to, you know, support and help other people as much as I can. Oh, we would have never reached the goal. Right, right. So it's about being a go-getter. And then it also becomes like, then everyone's in it with you. Because like everyone wants to make, we had people calling friends from, we, had, we shipped Australia, um, sh uh, Hong Kong. I mean, then it got went viral because everyone's like, we need you to buy a dress. And it was like, real oh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then you started M2057 mm -hmm. with Kickstarter mm -hmm. funding. Um, so tell us about the idea. Yeah. So, you know, M25, so what I wanted with a new collection was I didn't want to do luxury anymore. I mean, I consider this still kind of more industrial luxury, but I, I was like, who cares about the $1,000 dress? You know, I've done it. It's kind of cool. So if I'm going to design, you know, I don't think you step backwards and do what you did before. It's boring and, and it's not relevant. So for me, it was about technology. I was really, I'm, I'm the least tech person you'll ever meet. But I know it's out there, and I know it's stupid if you don't utilize some of it, even if you have to go through a th second party. So I'm surrounded by a lot of techies that do what I need, but I, you know, I'll admit that I haven't even figured out how to do social media yet. But um, <laughs> uh, So when I, I chose Kickstarter because I knew that was a tech space, right? And I wanted M2057 to be as much about technology as possible, taking advantage of that idea. And uh, so we launched on e-commerce. Um, the collection is about these amazing fabrics. And, and what's really cool about the collection is two fabrics. In the third, we're in our fourth season now, and it's still the same two fabrics. Tons of color difference, shape difference, very architectural. They're all cut edges, they're machine washable, they hang dry, complete opposite of what my last collection was about. And it opens it up to so many women that I knew that loved my collection before but couldn't afford it. So it's kind of, it's cooler. I mean, in, on so many levels, for me it is, anyway. Yeah, right. 
So you asked my inspiration. I mean, so architecture certainly plays in, and we're so lucky to be in a city with so much beautiful, I mean, Jeannie Gang's building is so impressive to me. I, I, I can look at that over and over and see something else. And so um, spring collection is, um, and there's always this theme of roots. I'm sure that has something to do with getting, you know, feeling like we are. <laughs> um, so the shapes are very um, architectural. They're the, especially this collection, it's like these opposing arcs that build the shape, but they're so unstructured. Uh, my idea is to keep it as minimal as possible on every level. Before my collection, I would be, I'd pride myself on a jacket that had 117 pieces, pattern pieces. Now it's like, how few pattern pieces can I use to get the result? So. So, and, and each season kind of builds on, on the next, but it's like, it's really about these sort of high function pieces that are, are and the other way I like to think of them is like a blank canvas. Be, uh, because I, I think this is a collection that's for just about pretty much anyone. I mean, any age could wear it, you'd style it differently. And that's what I really like about it. Whereas someone in your age group, I see everyone's here, what, 22? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, to 40, to 50, to 60 could wear it. And it's how you style it. You know, someone's gonna wear with, you know, I will always wear boots like this with it. Someone else is going to wear Manolo Blahniks with it, or someone else might wear even sneakers with it. And that's what I love about giving something that could be just personalized in a really cool way. And have you ever had a mentor? I mean, I'd say I have. It was interesting. I, I was thinking about this. Um, I've definitely had mentors on the business side, like Don Mello, Joan Weinstein. Don Mello was the president of Bergdorf Goodman. Um, but interestingly enough, and I, I think I have decided today that I'm going to pursue one. I've not ever had a, a creative mentor. So I think it would be kind of interesting to know someone. But I think part of it is because I'm such a snob, I don't know who I'd respect enough. Oops. <laughs> no. There's many, many. Jeannie Gang would be an amazing mentor. Okay? There's many. But I think it's, again, men mentors, it's got to be someone you're kind of in, like you want to kneel down and bow in front of, right? And so that's a high word. And, and I, I would take that lightly in terms of who I could feel that for. I mean, it would have to be multi-dimensional, both in their beliefs and their work and their, anyway. Um, so I just have two more questions and then. Um, so in the spirit of looking ugly, what would you say has been your ugliest moment? Um, ugliest? <laughs> um, um, I'd say closing a company is pretty damn ugly. It's no fun at all. I mean, it's heartbreaking. You feel like you're disappointing so many people. I mean, I think, and it takes a long time to get over the ugly moment. <laughs> so I'm definitely putting the cover on that box and nail in shut. <laughs> and then, um, to oppose that, what would you say has been your proudest moment? Um, I guess my proudest moment when, you know, you walk down the street in New York and you're in the window of Bergdorf Goodman and nothing kind of stacks up from there. Or, you know, having a garment hit in the Field Museum or, you know, those are pretty big moments. Uh, what is your biggest fear and how do you overcome your fears? Um, well, how I overcome my fears is a lot of meditation. Um, I, meditation and yoga, I mean, man, every morning it's become definitely a religion. Um, I have fears, there's fears around so many things, but I really come to realize that, you know what, it's like you just gotta like forget about it. And, um, and I guess the bigger thing is belief. Like, once you decide you're gonna do something, you have to believe in it like there is no doubt absolutely in your mind. When you start having those doubtful moments, that just sort of shatters everything. I mean, it doesn't mean that you won't sort of need to be a little circuitous with the process, but I think the fear piece could paralyze you. So I just try to stay away from it as much as possible. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm an MBA who likes fashion a lot. I had a really interesting kind of year looking at a lot of brands and how they expand. So I think to like Derek Lem and Ten Crosby, do you think they're introducing those smaller lines to hit a younger demographic, to expand a market, or because that's kind of the sweet spot right now for fashion so far as the target? I, I think it's all of those things. I think they want an, a younger audience, and I think it's price levels that both styling and the price warrants that you know a younger audience would be attracted to it 
And I think that, to be honest, I think the higher end is a harder, a harder track. So I think that it's kind of essential, almost. Hi, um, simple question. What do you think the biggest problem is in fashion today for um, not necessarily big proliferated designers, but um, maybe smaller to medium sized emerging designers? The biggest problem? Yeah. I just think uh, getting into it, it's because actually it's not getting into it. It's really easy to get into it, to start a brand, you know, to make a line of samples, but it's really hard to sustain. It's really like, I mean, your, your focus has to be so, so crystal clear because the competition is so fierce. And um, I think more than ever, you've got to really like find the need because otherwise there's no point. I mean, there's millions of us, millions, like, I mean, I can't believe how many schools in Chicago are cranking out fashion design students, right? Just Chicago. So if you multiply that by how many cities and how countries. So I think um, sustainability is the hardest piece. Yeah. Hi, you mentioned you, um, you volunteer with the Marwin organization, so I was just interested in finding out how that experience was working with kids. Uh, it's my favorite thing ever. Um, so part of what initiated, I had worked with Marwin a bit when I moved back from New York in 1991 and just stayed c in c connection, contact with the, with it's because it's such an amazing, do, do you all know what Marwin is? It's an inner city arts program and it's really amazing. I mean, the way they've grown from in the last 25 years. So part of my connection recently was that I'm trying to make M2057 zero waste. So we saved all the scraps because I also I think it's really intriguing to be, I think part of design is about creating a boundary and design in it, right? Um, so you have all this ne these negative shapes, but you have many of them, right? So when you cut a stack of 100, you've got this cool shape. Well, what could you do with that? It's really an interesting opportunity. So I contacted Marwin and I said, I'd love to give the students the fabric and co-teach the course. So we just finished and it it's a, was the most amazing experience both from seeing what they did with these remnant pieces of fabric and just, I, you know, talk about once you get your idea and like, so the, the course was 10 weeks. The first three weeks was sort of giving them ideas for techniques, weaving it, braiding it, knitting it, crocheting it. And then the, the rest of the time, then there were two weeks where they had to decide what they wanted to create. And then they had about four, if I do the math, don't hold me to those weeks. So then they had this window uh, to create, to make the piece. It was unbelievable what they made. I mean, just unbelievable. And I'm sorry I don't have some photos of it. Next time I promise I'll show you. They're amazing. So it was a really rewarding experience. Hi. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so you've been in the Chicago market for a very long time. Obviously you're on the mayor's council. Um, I'm just curious because, you know, there's not a lot of creative, especially in the areas of fashion and other things like that in the Chicago area. Do you find that it's supported? Do you find that it's growing? Do you find there's challenges? Have you ever thought, you know, Chicago's just not cutting it for me because this, it's just not as extensive as New York or LA or something? Um, I mean, that's a really good question, especially being in fashion. Um, but this is where I was kind of referring earlier probably to the idea of rebe rebellion. When someone says no, I do go yes. So when I decided to, I wanted to design again in 2012, um, I was talking to a lot of people and they're like, you, if you really want to be taken seriously in the fashion industry, you should move to New York. No, no actually, I, I was thinking about going to New York and then I was like, I went there, I spent a week just to kind of think about what it would feel like and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Then when I came back, someone said, that's a great idea because if you really want to be say, taken seriously, you should move to New York. And that was all I needed. I'm like, are you kidding me? I take myself really seriously and, I, and then I brought it back to the idea that I think Chicago, if you use it right, it, it's not New York. It doesn't need to be New York. It is something different and more on many levels. So I, I often refer to it as my incubator. Now, yes, it's limited and, and it is frustrating at times and a lot of layers of my process are still, you know, in New York. I mean, national press still is generated on New York. If I want to do wholesale distribution, I have to show in New York. My fabrics come from Europe, my, you know, my, you know, all the trims and supplies almost all come from New York. So it adds a layer, but there's a quality of life and there's something to, at this stage in my career, it just didn't make sense. I don't know if that answered the question, but, but there's enough, and I think there's enough dynamic, interesting people, look at the room is full of them, that make me feel like I'm supported and there's a network of creativity and friends and people that I continually meet. And that's what we need to do is like just support each other and know, we, you know, know each other, find each other. And there is enough of us here that we don't have to be in New York to find that. 
So, as you've grown and developed as a designer, um, do you look back at your past collections? Some of them is as ugly. Never. Um, do you think? <laughs> No, the ugly these. pieces never made it. So whatever, uh, here's the deal, but uh, let me fi let you finish the question. Oh, just, just like a second part, like, do you think that beauty is time sensitive? Unsensitive? Time. Time sensitive. Um, no, it's not at all. And if it is, then it was ugly to begin with, in my opinion. Um, so, so ugly. So first of all, I mean, you know what? You're never going to see anything I don't like of my work. I mean, that's great. That's called editing, right? And whenever we, I, I know that every time I do a collection, there's always a little bastard, okay? <laughs> um, so like this season, this last collection, um, I always name my pieces, right? So I was going through the web and I'm looking for women's names, right? And what pops up? Bad women in the Bible. I'm like, that's it. And so we named this piece Jezebel and it, may, it hit the cutting room floor. But the name is going to make another comeback. But there's always some pieces that you're not going to see because they just didn't work out. And I wouldn't say they were ugly, but more than anything, they just didn't work out. Um, so what I'm going to put out is what I love and believe in. And, you know, I don't think there's, it's really hard to be creative and admit that you like your work. Like, I don't know why. Why is that there that thing that you shouldn't be proud of what you, like, what is that? Is that my Catholic thing? I don't know. But I know there's that sort of. I, I try to be humble, but you know what? It's like, if you don't like your stuff, no one else is going to. So, I mean, I, like, I love what I do. It's fun, and I, you know, could someone do it better? Sure, have at it. But, you know, I enjoy what I'm doing, and hopefully I have enough of an audience that supports it. 